You are listening to Redfield Arts Audio. Brought to you by. For lovers of old time radio, here's Old Time Radio Revisited with Martin Grahams Jr. The supernatural sleuth with a menacing chuckle has become synonymous with the phrase old time radio, but frequent radio listeners knew him as Lamont Cranston, wealthy young man about town. Years prior, Cranston learned the strange and hypnotic secret how to cloud men's minds so they could not see him. As an invisible avenger, the shadow acted like a guilty conscience, a ghost-like voice of fear aroused in the minds of evildoers, criminals who accidentally exposed their own villainy or destroyed themselves after suffering a mental breakdown. Never committing cold-blooded murder for the sake of justice, the Shadow suffered a harrowing existence of close calls and death-defying challenges. His exploits were many, a career paced by chase and gunplay. Werewolves, vampires, psychotic murderers, gangsters, and mad scientists, he battled them all. The Shadow was aided by his girlfriend, the lovely Margot Lane, the only other person who knew his secret. The female element added suspense to the stories when she would often be captured by the villain and needed rescue by the shadow, facing some sort of death trap. The program left an impression on adults who enjoyed reading the pulp magazines and on young children who listened to the weekly chillers. But the shadow actually began on radio in 1930, not as a crime fighter, but as a host of a weekly series of bone-chilling murder plays. Street and Smith, a publishing company in New York City, licensed the rights to a bunch of short stories from their detective story magazine for use on the program and it did not take long for them to discover that people were asking at the newsstands not for Detective Story magazine, but for The Shadow magazine. So they hired a man named Walter Gibson, who was hired to write The Shadow novels, and the magazine was born. Years later, in 1937, under the guise of Orson Welles, the program changed to the crime fighter format we know today. A whole generation of youngsters tuned in every Sunday afternoon to listen to the spooky stories, including Isaac Asimov, who recounted in his autobiography, filching the exciting yarns of the Shadow Pulp magazine from his sleeping father and then replacing the magazine before he woke. Dick Ayers, creator of the Ghost Rider comic books, admitted years later that he was blending euthanisms in his interpretation of the Ghost Rider's speech, mimicking the style of the Shadow because he was a fan of the radio program. Science fiction author Alfred Bester wrote a number of radio scripts for the series and years later adapted one of them into a science fiction novel, The Demolished Man, and ended up winning a Hugo Award as a result. The Shadow was never among the highest rated programs of the time, as much as we'd like to look back at the show now, but reruns on local radio stations across the country during the 1970s, courtesy of syndication packages, revived interest and boosted the program's popularity to a generation that today is still enjoying the creepy crime fighter. Here, you're going to listen to an episode titled Murder from the Grave. It's about a master criminal who kills a scientist and steals a top secret serum that's capable of bringing the dead to life. And using this serum, the criminal revives dead bodies of numerous gangsters and forms an unstoppable gang of ghouls from the evening of April 6, 1941. shadow or on the air. These dramatizations are designed to demonstrate forcibly to old and young alike that crime does not pay. The shadow, mysterious character who aids the forces of law and order, is in reality Lamont Cranston, wealthy young man about town. As the shadow, Cranston is gifted with hypnotic power to cloud men's minds so that they cannot see him. Cranston's friend and companion, the lovely Margot Lane, is the only person who knows to whom the voice of the invisible shadow belongs. Today's drama, one of the shadow's most thrilling adventures, Murder from the Grave. That's him there. 
Walking towards the corner. Yeah. Pulling closer to the curb. Okay, okay. Wait till we're right beside him, see? Yeah, I know. All right. Let him have it. Yeah. They did a pretty complete job, officer. Yeah, he must have stopped every slug they threw at him. He's still breathing, though, and I don't know why. Well, uh, we better get him to the hospital at once. Here, give me a hand with him, will you? Okay, but it looks to me like a waste of time. Well, what's the story, Doc? DOA, officer. Dead on arrival. Yeah, I figured that. Well, better make out a report. You want to send him to the city morgue or hold him here at the hospital? I'll check headquarters and find out. Yes. Gangster, isn't he? Might say so. Do you recognize him at all? Well, now, how can I answer that? The guy ain't got hardly no face left, has he? Uh, good evening, Dr. Henry. Oh, hello, Dr. Metzger. What brings you down here to the receiving room? Uh, just keeping in touch with the activities of the hospital. Well, what have you there? A uh, gang shooting, Doctor. He seems to be well perforated. Yes. Especially the face. He's been just about shot away. Yes. So I see. He died on the way to the hospital. hospital. So, uh, mind if I have a look at him? No, Doctor. No, go ahead. I'm going to use your phone, Doc. I'll be right back. All right, officer. Dr. Henry. Yes? Did I understand you to say that you have pronounced this man dead? Why, why yes, Doctor. I'm afraid you were mistaken. What? This man is still alive. Well, Dr. Metzger, I couldn't feel any pulse. Yeah, no heart you, he is alive. Ring for the elevator at once. But, Doctor, I say, you... this man is to be brought to my laboratory. Hurry, Doctor, there's no time to lose. <laughs> Dr. Henry speaking. Hello, this is Dr. Metzger. Oh, yes, Doctor. That patient, the man who was brought to my laboratory, is alive and can be saved. Why, why that's unbelievable, Doctor. Nevertheless, it is true. But what about his face? His face has been shot away. I intend to give him a new face. Now, listen to me, Dr. Henry. I want a general order given to all in the hospital that I am not to be disturbed for the next six weeks. Uh, yes, sir. All of my meals and any surgical instruments or supplies that I might need are to be left outside of my door for that period, you understand? Uh, yes, Dr. Metzger, I... If these orders are carried out, I can tell you now, Henry, that in six weeks' time, I will bring forth a man who is whole again. Doggone it, Jack. I just can't help it. Old man, curiosity is getting the better of me. And you've got to find out what goes on in Metzger's laboratory. Is that it? Yes. <laughs> He's been in there almost six weeks now, Jack. Imagine almost six weeks without telling anyone how his experiment is progressing. Say, does anyone even know if the patient is still alive? Yes, we do know that much. Metzger sent word to that effect to Doc Hawkins yesterday. <laughs> Look, Sherlock, how do you plan to get into the laboratory? Well, when Metzger opens the door for this tray of food, uh -huh. I'll just walk in with him, that's all. Good luck. Yes, I'll leave it. Uh, knock on the door for me, will you? Sure. Who is there? Your food tray, Dr. Metzger. Oh, thank you. Uh, where do you want me to put... Uh, uh, one moment. Uh, you believe the tray with me, Dr. Henry. Well, I was just going you to put... You were just going to try to gain entrance to my laboratory. <laughs> I'm aware of your intense curiosity, Henry. A curiosity that is shared by everyone else in this hospital. Ah, well, you can tell them all for me that my experiment is nearing completion. Very well, Doctor. If they wish, if they wish, they when may come here to my laboratory tomorrow at noon. <laughs> and I shall reveal to them my finished product. I don't know what we're waiting for. Uh, Dr. Dr. Metzger asked us all to be here at noon today. It's now quarter after. I, for one, see no reason for waiting around any longer. You're right, Henry. Well, what do we do? Well, we'll let him know we're here. Dr. Metzger. Dr. Metzger. Why doesn't he answer? Well, there's only one way to find that out. Let's start trying to get in. The door isn't locked. I'll go look for him. Uh, Dr. Metzger. Dr. Metzger? He must be in there. He's not out here. Look, come here, all of you. Oh, what is it? Look, look, there on the floor. Oh, hold. It's Metzger. He's dead. Yes. And it looks like murder. His face has been slashed. Look, here on the floor. A broken mirror. Where's the patient? The man he was working on. There was no one else in this room when I came in. Well, then he's gone. Yes. But not before he murdered Dr. Metzger. Uh... And since that time, Lamont, the police have learned nothing. 
Well, that's understandable, Dr. Hawkins. They really have nothing to work on. You have no idea what this Mr. X looks like, have you, Dr. Hawkins? No, we haven't, Margo. Dr. Metzger did a plastic job on his face, changed it completely. That's all we know. Well, it's been 24 hours since the killing. The man has had ample time to get away and cover up his tracks. Yes. I don't see how Lamont can do any more than the police have done, Doctor. Uh, I didn't ask Lamont to come here for that purpose, Margo. Oh, no? No, I... Well, I discovered something in Dr. Metzger's laboratory that I hadn't even told the police about. Well, why not? Because it's something too fantastic for them to believe. Well, what is it, Doctor? Metzger's personal notebook, in which he recorded the progress of his experiment. I have it right here. Well, what does this notebook contain? Well, the first entry was written the night the patient arrived in the hospital. Dr. Metzger wrote in the notebook at that time... Tonight, I have at last been given the opportunity that I have been so patiently waiting for. The perfect subject for my experiment is at this very moment lying on a table before me. I have given him the first injection of the solution. The reaction was most successful. Now, the real work begins. What does all that mean, Dr. Hawkins? You learn later, Lamont. Just as I learned as I read further into the notes. The next entry of any importance came a week later. At that time, the doctor wrote... Everything is progressing satisfactorily. Today, the patient has sufficient strength for me to begin the plastic work. I have found that best results can be obtained by giving injections of the solution every 24 hours. This is most important. Any period of time beyond this is dangerous. Well, what is the solution that he keeps talking about? I'm coming to that, Margot. I'll skip over the entries that follow. They deal mainly with a growing conflict between the patient and Metzger. A note of regret creeps into his writing. You sense that he's almost sorry for the work that he's done. Eventually, this conflict claims to open hatred. And in the last entry, written the night before he died, Dr. Metzger wrote... May heaven have mercy on me for ever conceiving this work that I have done. The patient has now reverted to the vicious being that he has always been. Instead of having gratitude for what I have done, he shows only resentment. Tomorrow morning, I shall remove the bandages that cover his face. He has threatened me that if he is not pleased with my work, dire consequences will result. This, then, is the fruit of my labor. This is the price I pay for my great discovery. My discovery of a solution that literally brought a dead man back to life again. A solution with which... So that's it. That was the secret solution. Yes. But that's unbelievable, Dr. Hawkins. A solution that brings the dead back to life? Metzger was a great scientist. Nothing was impossible to him. Well, where is the solution now? I couldn't find it. I've searched everywhere in the laboratory. Then it's evident that the patient, knowing about it, took it with him. I'm afraid so. Well, I'd say you had good cause for alarm, Doctor. This killer who is now at large is a man returned from the dead. A man without a soul. Yes, that's true. But uh, tell me, Lamont, have you gotten any clues from what you've just learned? Only one. The broken mirror that was found near the doctor's bunny. Obviously, this mirror must have been shattered by the missing man. Why do you say that? He must have broken it in range when he first saw his new face. Metzger must have made him sufficiently horrible to bring on this range. So we have only one clue to work on. A man with an incredibly ugly face. Dr. Hawkins! Dr. Hawkins! What is it? What is it? Come in. Dr. Hawkins, something terrible has happened. There. What's wrong? In the morgue. The hospital mall just a few minutes ago. Yes, what happened? A man with a gun came in, forced me to take one of the bodies, a dead body, out to a car. What? I... I had to obey. Why didn't you call out for help? I... I was about to until I saw his face. His face, Dr. Hawkins. It was the most frightening thing I've ever seen. It wasn't human. Doctor, I'd say our killer has made his first move. And I fear that it won't be his last. While we're waiting for the curtain to rise in Act Two of Murder from the Grave, I want to ask you something. When the summer months come, what are you going to do for a supply of hot water? Would you be able to have all the hot water you want, when you want it? And will it be available at a cost within your budget? This is an important problem in many homes. 
That's why today, the blue coal dealers of America are offering the latest in low-cost hot water heating equipment. They've given you the blue coal automatic heat regulator. They've given you the John Barclay home heating service. And now, in 1941, the same blue coal dealers bring you the equipment that provides all the low-cost hot water you want. Yes, the new Blue Coal Deluxe Water Heater that works automatically gives you more clean hot water than you can use. Think of it. Now, at last, you can have an abundant supply of clean hot water heated at just the right temperature and whenever you want it, all summer long. Phone your neighborhood dealer tomorrow and ask him about this new Blue Coal Deluxe Water Heater. Remember, it will pay for itself in savings over the usual cost of summer hot water. And remember, too, when it comes to keeping your home warm and comfortable, there's no other fuel like blue coal. Give your dealer a call in the morning. His name is listed in the where to buy it section of your classified telephone directory under the words blue coal. All right. Put the slip in the car. <laughs> yes, sir. We're getting to be regular customers, ain't we? Uh, why do you do this? Why do you want these bodies? You'll find out. Everybody will find out very soon. This ain't our last visit to you, Mr. Morekeeper. Uh, you'll be seeing us again. No, no, you'll get me into trouble. Shut if... up. All right, Eddie, step on the gas. Let's get out of here. Extra, extra, another gangster's bunny kidnapped from the morgue. Uh, that particular pendant will cost you $2,000. Oh, I there see. There we are. Well, yeah. Mr. Stick-up. Oh, uh, what do you want with that? You oh, can't get away with this. No. no. Just watch us. Grab them rings, Eddie. Hi. Phil, take that for your bracelets. Okay. Ah, uh, that's all we need here. Wait a minute, boys. Before we blow, we ought to let the folks have a look at us for purposes of identification. Take off your mask, boys. Oh, oh no. no. They're not you. Oh, how horrible. We ain't very pretty, are we? Well, nobody is. Once they've been dead. Look, only three guards for a payroll over a hundred grand. Cut them off, Eddie. Squeeze them into the curb. Right. Good work. Come on, boys. What do you guys think you're trying to do? You'll find out soon enough, Buster. You men, stand where you are. We've got a Tommy gun here. Go ahead and use it, brother. Go ahead. All right. You ask for it. <laughs> Don't you know better than to shoot at a mob that's already been dead? <laughs> Let them have it, boys. Margot, the entire city has been terrorized by this mob of, well, ghouls. That's all you can call them. Lamont, do you honestly believe that this gang consists of the dead men who were kidnapped from the different morgues? Yes, Margot. There's no doubt of it. They've been sustained by Dr. Metzger's life-giving solution. Oh, how horrible. And so far, no one has been able to learn just where this gang is hiding out. Well, what can be done, Lamont? Well, one of the mob was captured by the police this afternoon. They've got him in the city jail. Did he reveal anything? No, he refused to talk. That is, to the police. But I have an idea that I might be able to get something from him. I think I know what you mean, Lamont. I think you do. I'm paying a little visit to his cell. As the shadow. Why don't they come for me? They know the cops have got me. Why don't they come? <laughs> what was that? So, your friends have deserted you, eh? Who's talking to me? I must be getting stir-crazy. I don't see nobody. You're not stir-crazy. I've merely made myself invisible to you. You made yourself invisible? Oh, I get it. The shadows paint me a bit. That's quite correct. What are you doing here? I've come to talk to you, to learn something about you and your companions. Save your talk. I ain't saying nothing. I know the horrible secret that you and your gang possess. The power that you have to bring life to the bodies of those already dead. How'd you learn? <laughs> Where'd you ever dream up an idea like that? I followed the activities of your leader from the day he killed Dr. Metzger and stole the life-giving solution. I don't know what you're talking about. Yes, you do. You're being foolish enough to remain loyal to your mob after they've deserted you. That ain't true. Then why haven't they tried to get you out of this jail? 
Certainly they must know that you'll soon need another injection of the serum. Uh, what are you talking about? I learned from Dr. Metzger's own journal that the life-giving solution must be injected every 24 hours. To go beyond this period without it means a return to the dead. No. No, you're just trying to scare me. How long has it been since you received your last treatment? Yesterday. Just about this time. Then its effect should be wearing off right now. We must act quickly. Tell me where the hideout is. And after dealing with your friends, I promise to bring back enough of the serum to keep you alive. Uh, are you sure you ain't handing me no line? I swear it. Now, tell me the secret hiding place and just how many men there are. Okay. Okay. About the men, the boss has only two henchmen left now. Phil and Marty. It's been getting harder to make snatches from the morgue. And besides, the boss don't want to waste the serum on us dead ones anyway. Only two days ago, he let one of the boys go back to the grave <laughs> without a shot from the hypo. Believe me, Shadow, his face wasn't pretty to see. Quickly now. Where's the hideout? <laughs> the hideout? Well, it's... <laughs> hey, what's happening to me? I got a funny feeling in my head. Quickly, man, quickly. <laughs> my... Buzzing. Tell me where the hideout is. It, it, I, I... How much better for them to have left you untouched after death had claimed you the first time. Well, Margot, we're certain of one thing. What's that, Lamont? That our Mr. X, having built up his mob from the remains of notorious gangsters is now finding it difficult to get bodies of gangsters who, before they died, knew their trade. Correct. Also, he's obviously running low on Dr. Metzger's solution. He's letting his lesser helpers die without giving them injections. Correct again. Well, then, here's my plan. I'm going to ask Commissioner Weston to plant a story in all the newspapers that a notorious out-of-town gang leader, Dutch Carson, has just been killed by the police. Who's Dutch Carson, Lamont? A Middle Western mobster who dropped out of sight about a year ago. Well, why are you doing all this? To attract the attention of Mr. X. Then I shall arrange with the commissioner to be taken to the city morgue and be placed on a slab as the body of the dead Dutch Carson. And unless I'm badly mistaken, Margot, within 24 hours, the three missing ghouls will be back in their graves, and this time, for good. <laughs> Ready to stretch out on the slab, Mr. Cranston? All right, Tom. <laughs> you know, you're the first live stiff I ever had in here. <laughs> well, I hope I remain that way. Yeah. And will you cover me over with a sheet, please? Yeah, uh, sure. Hey, what's going to happen when these fellas find out you ain't a dead one, much less the missing Dutch Carson? <laughs> well, not Tom. Huh? It's something I'd rather worry about when it happens, if you don't mind. Yeah, I'm here to tell you I wouldn't touch your That's job. Quiet. Huh? I hear footsteps outside the door. Yeah, yeah, somebody's there. Who are you? Take a look at me, Pop. That ought to answer your question. You, uh, you come again. Uh, yeah, I told you I'd be paying you another visit. Well, uh, what do you want? I want the body of Dutch Carson. I got a little job he's going to do for me. Phil. Huh? Makes up a shot of the solution. Hey, it ain't time yet, boss. We don't need none for another hour. It ain't for us, stupid. For a new guy I just snatched out of the morgue. I got him in the next room. Yeah, but we're running low on his stuff. Mix it up, I said. We can use this guy. He's valuable. Huh? Who is he? Dutch Carson. Dutch? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't know him, but I heard of him. He's, uh... Well, I don't know him either. But he was supposed to be one of the smarter boys in the Middle West until he disappeared about a year ago. What happened to him? I don't know, but what's important now is that we've got his body in the next room. Hey, what's that? What's going on out there? Come on, get inside, you. Hey, why'd you bring that dame in here, Marty? Well, I caught her snooping around outside trying to look in a window. <laughs> Maybe she was trying to cop a quick look at a couple of dead men, eh, boss? Interesting. What's the idea, girlie? Well, it was just a... Oh, your face. Find something wrong with it? You're the one. You're the one that killed Dr. Metzger. Oh, so interesting. Where'd you get your remember? Let me out of here. Not a chance. Now sit down like a lady like this. <laughs> You can't push me around like that. No, well, I'm giving you a pretty good imitation, ain't I? 
Now, what were you doing outside? Who sent you here? You're so clever. Why don't you find out? Who sent you here? Answer me. Oh, oh stop it. You're hurting my oh, Lamont. And Lamont. Lamont. Won't do you no good, Mr. Lamont. Where is he? What have you done with him? I ask you a question. Wait a minute. Done with who? Who are you talking about? You brought him here. What have you done with him? Hey, she must mean the stiff inside. Now, what is this? Who'd you bring here, boss? The body of Dutch Carson. Why? Dutch Carson? Yeah, I snatched him from the morgue. You heard of him, Marty? Heard of him? Are you kidding? A year ago, I buried Dutch Carson a load of concrete at the bottom of a river. I see. Hey, then who did you bring here, boss? I don't know. Hold on to this day. Yeah. I'm soon going to find out. He's gone. The body's gone. It's a trap. The cops are behind us. Yeah, one thing is sure. The guy is still in the house. Marty, go out and look around the grounds. Okay, boss. And now, if you don't mind... But I do mind. You're staying right here. No, keep away from Give me. Give me that knife, Phil. No, it's no! Sadly, boss, here you are. What are you going to do? I'm going to carve that pretty face of yours to ribbon. No, don't! No, don't! Keep away! Get ready, sister. <laughs> <laughs> Who laughed? Not quite so fast, Mr. Aiken. Hey, hey, what's happening? What? You're not touching that girl. Hey, who done that? Who knocked that knife out of my hand? I did, Mr. X. Who's speaking? Where's that voice coming from? It's coming from the shadow. It's the shadow, eh? Well, now, Shadow, this is one time you've stubbed your toe. Because even you can't do anything to dead men. You're wrong, Mr. X, because I know that you need an injection of Dr. Metzger's solution every 24 hours in order to continue living. Yeah, and we aim to continue getting it. I wouldn't be too sure of that. What do you mean by that, boss? I mean that I now possess the solution. You see? Look. Look, the bottle hanging there in midair. He's got the solution. Give me that bottle, Shadow. Oh, no. This is my hold on you, gentlemen. And I shall keep it until your allotted time expires. I shall watch you return to the dead again. Get away from him, boss. Quick. I'll get it all right. We may not be able to see your shadow, but we can see the bottle. Boss, put that gun away. That ain't the way to do it. Oh, <laughs> now you've done it. You hit the wrong target, Mr. X. Oh, you broke it, boss. You broke the bottle. It spilled all over the floor. I didn't mean to hit the bottle. I wanted to plug him. You'd better give up, Mr. X. Oh, no, we ain't giving up. We still got another hour to live, Shadow. Now, luck can be done in that time. We're going to rip this town wide open just for luck. Wait. You're staying here. Yeah, try and stop us. Marco, they've got an hour to spread the greatest terror this city has ever seen. I've got to stop them. We ain't got much time, boss. Look in the back, Marty's gone already. Yeah, I know, Phil. Will we look as bad as that when we return to the dead? We'll never know. Besides, right now, we got a little fun ahead of us. Now, when we get to town, shoot and keep shooting at anybody who gets in our way. They're going to remember us when we get done, Phil. Okay, boss. Hey, hey, watch your driving. This is a narrow bridge. You know, it's something that's pulling the wheel. What? I can't straighten it out. <laughs> You'll never straighten it out, Mr. Shut Shut up. How did he get here? I've been with you since you left your hideout, gentlemen. Hey, let go of the wheel. Shut up. So that you can carry on your campaign of ruthless killing. Oh, no. Hey, he's trying to steer us into the river. Where is he? Yeah, he must be on the running board. Hey, let go, Shadow. Don't be a fool, Shadow. If we drown, you'll drown, too. That's not as important as the lives of the innocent people you're planning to kill. Yeah, Phil, Phil, I can't hold the wheel much longer. Stop the car! Stop the car! Too late! Too late! But, Lamont, you might have been drowned, along with your ghostly friends. I certainly might have been, Margot. But fortunately, I threw myself pin into the car before it went over the bridge. You know, Lamont, I've become very attached to you. Oh, don't think for a minute that all our mad exploits together hadn't been fun. But I wish that for a while, at least, we could have a calm, peaceful existence. And we shall have, Margot. We shall have. Mm-hmm. Well, nonetheless, I'm sure you'll forgive me if I hang on to my hat when we start out again next week. <laughs> Today's program is based on a story copyrighted by The Shadow Magazine. Characters, names, places, and plot are fictitious. Any similarity to persons living or dead is purely coincidental. And now, fresh from the records of the New York General Sessions Court, we bring you conclusive proof that crime does not pay. New York City, December 13th, 1940. Stephen Fleming passes bad check in business deal. Crime, grand larceny in the second degree. New York City, April 1st, 1941. 
Stephen Cummings sentenced to serve 15 years to life in state's prison. The weed of crime bears bitter fruit. Crime does not pay. The shadow knows. <laughs> Please come back again for our next show. The original content of this program is copyright the Mark Redfield Company. All other content used by permission of the respective rights holders or used for educational and informational purposes. This is your announcer, Mary Ann Perry. Available now from Redfield Arts Audio. Baghdad. The great city and its citizens are celebrating. Now, as I am a river to my people. You must kill her, my handsome and still skeptical Captain Sinbad. The only good pirate is a dead one. Brace yourself, Captain Bula! The pirates are upon us! Their ship comes alongside us! I shall not rest until all of Badra's ships are burnt. You remind me of only one other swordsman with such skill. Who? Me! What is that in that vial? This? Simply the blood of a siren mixed into a potion that I now drink. Look! Look! She changes, Captain! For you and the people of Zalos, I have complete faith in Sinbad. He's the very man you need.